Hallelujah. Glory to God. We pour out our praise to Him. He were, he's worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Amen. I believe with all my heart, God's going to do something really special in our lives through His Word. Uh, this, pat, this, this, this entire series has been amazing. And it just seems like we're going from one level to the next. If you are visiting with us today, uh, we're about to minister a message called Understanding Babel. And uh, in all of my years in ministry, outside of preaching in the pulpit, my number one effort has been in marriage counseling. And even beyond marriages, I have watched through the decades family members and friends impacted negatively where relationships were torn, even within churches, and greatly impacted. God is depositing in us spirit of wisdom and revelation concerning this area of life to take communication and relationships to the next level. So I want you one more time just to lift your hands up before God. And I just want you to ask him through his word today to do a work on the inside of you. Say this out loud, Father, in the name of Jesus, enlighten the eyes of my understanding and help me be better in all the relationships of my life. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn around and wave at somebody and you may be seated. Amen. And then open with me, if you would, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Hello to everybody who's logged in and tuned in online. Thank you for being a part of our worship service today. And then if you are visiting with us at some point, we'd love to have you come into one of our services. Um, this is a safe place. You, you can't catch the coronavirus at church. I say that spiritually. Amen. Jesus is here. He's the healer. And this is a safe place in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 4, which is our text for today, Verse 25 through 31, it says, Therefore, put in a way line, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Now, if you're married, uh, put spouse in that place. Uh, if you're unmarried and you hope to be married, this is for you. If you've got friendships, work relationships, family relationships, he's talking about relationship. He said, let each one of you Speak truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no more, but let him rather labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may give, to, give something to him who has need. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Then he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be, be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Be kind to your spouse. Be kind to your family members, folks on your job. Be tenderhearted. Be forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. So we're, we're in this series, and I, I feel like I may be being directed by the Lord to put this in a book. I've never written a book. I've started writing uh, either one or two books. Um, I've got one, all the chapters and stuff. I just really need to get the editing done. Um, but I feel very, very strongly about this. Like I said, I'm, I'm licensed uh, in ministry professionally as a marriage counselor and uh, just through the years you know I, I, I see I've seen uh, firsthand the terrors of divorce uh, the impact that it has not only on the individuals but the children uh, the families loved ones uh, the effect essentially of divorce between relationships. I've seen family members where they don't even talk to their siblings, you know, broken relationships. And at the end of the day, what I've learned in counseling thousands upon thousands of hours on a weekly basis, not thousands in a week, but just in my history, 
um, is that it comes down to communication, communication problems. If you Google the number one and number two causes of divorce, they'll list, um, you know, intimate relationships and then money as the number one or number two, and they interchange. Uh, and then the list just goes on. But at the end of the day, it's not the communication about the intimate relationship. It's not the intimate relationship. It's the communication about it. It's not the money. It's the communication about the money. Money doesn't cause divorce. It's the communication about it. And even in the last 20, 30 years where blended families are concerned, uh, where you're dealing with the realities that not every child in the home is biological of both parents in the home, um, the issue of what happens where a child is concerned is really big. I'm talking about clinically on a regular basis. You know, this is not your child, and it's affecting your marriage. Uh, the outside of your relationship with God, the single most important relationship in your life. And it has to be mitigated because, you know, this child was born maybe when you were young, maybe when you were old from a, a, a different relationship, you're not there biological parent. I mean, just stuff stirs up. And if, if you don't have good communication skills, the enemy's going to bring in a wedge because he doesn't want you to be married. If you're unmarried, he doesn't want you to be married. He doesn't want you to learn the, uh, the, the lessons about communication uh, because he doesn't want God's will for your life. Amen. So I, I am a, I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to you to learn this. God is taking some very precious time to deposit into you some skills to help you take communication in your life to the next level. Now, in this series, I am giving you three tools, three tools. And a good student at the end of the series will know what those three tools are and have a basic idea of how to use those three tools. Everybody in here knows what a hammer is. If you don't know what a hammer is, hold your hand up. I got one in the truck. I'll show you. No, I'm kidding. Everybody in here knows what a hammer is. Everybody knows what a screwdriver is. Everybody knows what a wrench is. You don't use a hammer when you need a screwdriver. And you don't use a wrench when you need a hammer. Now, I've seen people try to hammer something with a wrench and try to turn something with a hammer. But in reality, that's not what the tool is for. So I want you to be as familiar with these things uh, in, by the end. Listening on three dimensions is one of the tools you'll need in communication. In order to be a good communicator, you've got to be a great listener. That's an important lesson. We already talked about that. If you're here, if you're new, you can go back and listen to it. It's all free online. The second tool I'm giving you is where we're at right now, rules of engagement. Okay, in rules of engagement, there are six rules. Now, if you go outside of or if you break one of these six rules, then you're on your own. But if you if you follow these six rules, you'll have God to help you and you'll be able to communicate effectively in any given situation. And then the last tool I'm going to give you at the end, which is to be a couple of more weeks, uh, will be communicating with love and respect. You'll love it. So let me give you all six rules of engagement before we begin on what we'll cover today. When we talk about rules of engagement in communication, there are six rules. Number one, stop lying and tell the truth. Number two, if you choose anger, which already tells you it's not automatically, it's a choice. Anger is absolutely a choice and it's not a sin. But if you choose anger, don't sin. Number three, don't give place to the devil. Woo, man, last week, that was outstanding. Number four, which is what we're going to talk about today, is keep it clean. Number five is don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And number six is be nice. I have a vision in my heart before this series is over. I don't know if I'll be able to do it. But I want to put these six rules um, and frame it so you could take it home and put it in your kitchen or in your bedroom. So if you ever find yourself in the midst of having an important conversation with your children, with your spouse or your loved ones, that you can remember what these six are, because this is God teaching you how to communicate 
And all of these come right out of Ephesians chapter 4. So let's talk today about rule number four, keep it clean. Somebody say, keep it clean. In the King James Version of Ephesians 4.29, it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This is a rule in communication. God is saying through Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, do not allow, when you're in a conversation with your boss, when you're in a conversation with your spouse, maybe somebody on a team at your church, with your child, or with your parent, do not allow corrupt communication to come out of your mouth. So today we're going to look at what is corrupt communication? Because that could mean a lot of things. The first thing I want you to note about it is, is, is really a reminder. The Bible uses the word communication only six times in the King James Version. Four of those times are in the New Testament. And the first time in the New Testament the Bible talks about communication is in Matthew 5, 37, where Jesus said, In communication, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Then he said, anything more than this comes from the devil. Now, we just learned last week to not give place to the devil. Don't give him a foothold. Don't give him any room in the conversation. And so we looked at how does the devil come at us? He comes at through, his talk, through our thoughts and through our temptation. But Jesus said, let your communication say what you mean and mean what you say. And anything more than that comes from the devil. He gets involved in communication when you go outside that bound. The other two times communication is used in the New Testament is, is right here in Ephesians 4 and then also in Colossians 3, where it talks about corrupt communication and filthy communication. So if I want to take my communication to the next level, I especially want to know what does the Bible say about communication. We need to know what corrupt communication is, what filthy communication is, because God said, don't let it come out of your mouth. That's a rule. Don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. And then the fourth time, of course, it tells us, the Bible tells us that communication can become effectual. You can be an effective communicator. But let's notice this word corrupt. The Bible uses this word corrupt, so let's get an idea what is corrupt communication? Well, in Ephesians 4, just before we get to verse 29, in verse 22 and 23, the Bible actually talks about something being corrupt. Notice in verse 22, he tells us that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt. Somebody say corrupt. No, no, no. Everybody say corrupt. That grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the Bible in chapter 4 uses the word corrupt twice, but notice he brings up this issue of putting off your former conduct. Do you see that in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 22? He said, put off your former conduct. Somebody say former conduct. Make a mental note because he's talking about past history. Former conduct, he says, put off concerning your past history. In communication, we've got to deal with the issue of past history. I'll bring that up later. But notice he says that there's something about it that grows corrupt. It grows corrupt. Um, what you'll learn about things that are corrupted, they don't start off that way. They end up that way. They, as the scriptures say, grow corrupt. And then verse 23 says, brings in the idea about the mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Somebody say, in my mind, things can grow corrupt. Now, this word corrupt, when it's used in the Bible, in different ways, it means rotten. You know, that tomato that you bought, 
It was nice at the store when you got it, but when you were ready to use it, it was rotten. That's what the word corrupt means or worthless. It also means in the Bible of poor quality. So when it talks about something, corrupt communication, it's talking about poor quality, bad or unfit for use. So what I'm thinking of as it relates to corrupt communication, have you ever been in a conversation where you or somebody that you were talking to had a poor choice of words? Amen. It, the, the, it, it, it was poor or it was a poor choice of words, a poor quality. Here's another thing. It's, when you talk about something that's rotten, it started off good, but it turned. Oh, I got an all right on this side, so let me come over here. Have you ever been in a conversation where it started off good, but it turned? That is the essence of corrupt communication. You know, you were starting to say the right things, but something happened either outside of you or inside of you. And what started off good turned bad. And the word bad was in that word. So uh, let's look at now Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Is this good for anybody? All right. Verse 8 and 9 says, but now you also, this is God talking to you. He says, put off, get rid of all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication." Out of your mouth. Verse 9 says, lie not. Another something something you should get off. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So in Colossians chapter 3, this is the second time the Bible talks about filthy communication. This time he calls it um, uh, corrupt communication. This time he calls it filthy communication. Notice this is something that you've got to put off and get rid of. What do you mean filthy communication? Well, one of the things we know that can corrupt communication is lying. In verse 9, he said, lie not to one another. So let me give you what this word filthy means before I give you what I'm going to say. Filthy communication is referring to vile conversation, foul speaking, Low or obscene speech, shameful speaking, like my brother said on uh, Wednesday night when he was preaching about communication. Um, He said, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? (laughs) Have you ever heard that expression? You, You know, you out there, you know. So when we talk about getting rid of corrupt communication, this is one of our rules. You got to keep it clean. Don't let it turn. Don't let it become vile. Don't let it go bad. What he's referring to is vile conversation, foul speaking. When you talk about foul speaking, we use the word foul language. How many of you all know cussing shouldn't be a part of your conversation? Come on, somebody. Now, I live essentially in a bubble. I don't cuss, okay? And my wife, she don't cuss. Uh, My son, Stanley, he's four. He don't cuss. And my three-year-old, he don't cuss. Amen. So we work from home, and none of us cuss. When we come to church, y'all don't cuss at me. I don't cuss at you. Oh, y'all got to help me. It's quiet. I know it's going to be quiet, so I'm going to take a minute. Amen. Because I'm amazed in marriage counseling sessions at the times that I hear where foul language is used between loved ones. You know, I, I go to the barbershop, but most of them are respectful. There's not an environment where cuss words are. I mean, when I'm out at the market. And, so I don't live where that's a common place. But I believe that this is a relevant word for the church today because it should not be in our communication, especially with those that we love. It shouldn't be that we are... Uh, using foul language with our wife or using foul language with our husband or our children. Amen. It's quiet in this church. 
So let's look at rule number four. This is about to get amazing. I've just been jumping up and down since the Lord's been giving me this this week. Somebody say out loud. So rule number four is keep it clean. What can corrupt communication? This message is not just about you not using cuss words. The Bible says that even a soft tongue can break the bones. You don't even have to be yelling or using obscene language to hurt somebody deeply. So what can corrupt communication? The first thing that we see even in this passage is lying. Would you agree with me that if in a conversation either you are lying or the person you're talking to is lying, it's going to cause that, that communication to be corrupted. And, and obviously the obvious shouldn't be. We shouldn't tell a bold-faced lie. But in reality, what I've seen is that it's when we are not saying what we mean and when we are not meaning what we say. If I ask you in the conversation, how are you doing? And you say, I'm fine. And we're talking about some heart-to-heart stuff. And, you know, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, are we okay with this? Yeah, we're good. If we're not good and you're saying we're good, communication got corrupted. Because on the inside, I could be digging a deeper ditch. I could have said something that, that really hurt you. And we need to deal with that in order for us to move forward. So the number one way that the scripture is describing that corrupts communication is lying. So obviously we cover this in rule number one. But please know when God says don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Number one, lying actually corrupts communication. And the important thing to note is to say what you mean and mean what you say. What else can corrupt communication? Well, I was thinking through the list, and the Spirit of God took me to the the next verse that we looked at, which was, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. And I thought for a moment, is it possible that anger could corrupt communication? The immediate thought is, yes, you know, if you're angry about something, then anger alone is going to corrupt the communication. But then the Lord reminded me that even God gets angry. And God may communicate with us as a result of his anger. But you all you all got to know it's not going to be corrupted. So anger alone shouldn't corrupt communication unless It's expressed the wrong way. So when the Bible says be angry, which is it's a choice if you choose to be angry, but he says you can be angry, but don't sin. Now, there's many different ways that you can sin as a result of being angry. He takes it to the next level by saying, do not let the sun, watch this, go down upon your what? Wrath. Make a note of this because wrath is the second thing that I want to point out to you that can corrupt communication. And this is serious. Wrath. What is wrath? Wrath is the expression of anger. Oh, what is that? I'm angry, but I expressed it. Right? Yelling is an expression and can be an expression of wrath. If you choose to be angry, watch how you express it. Because wrath can corrupt communication. Now, as I said, I feel like I need to write a book, or the Lord's leading me to write a book. There's some amazing books that are written about marriage and relationships. Okay? And I've used many books for many years About seven years ago, I come into contact with, hands down, the number one best book for married people, pre-married and for married people. And it's called Love and Respect by Emerson Egrich. Love and Respect, which is going to be like the third rule that I give you, and it is phenomenal. 
But one of the first books I read as a young pastor in, in preparing uh, for counseling ministry was called Love Busters, another great book. And there were six different love busters that he identified. And he tells stories about each. Dishonesty is a love buster. But also angry outbursts is a love buster. What am I saying? Because of what I've seen, I'll call it in a clinical sense. When you express anger, which is wrath, it corrupts communication. Because you have a right to be angry about what I did. But how are you expressing it? Oh, come on, somebody. How you're expressing it is affecting how I'm hearing what you are trying to say. And God already warned us to be, if you choose anger, don't sin with it. Why? Because if you express it, if you express anger the wrong way, then you're going to corrupt the message that you're trying to send. I'll keep going. I know it's quiet. In James chapter 1 and verse 19, always remember this. I was thinking, maybe I should make this a rule, like make it seven rules. But I was like, no, no, because it's a different passage and I want your heart focused on Ephesians 4. But always remember in communication to so then, my brethren, let every man, that's all else, every man, every woman, every person under the sound of my voice and those of you that are online. The Bible says, be swift to hear, be slow to speak, and to be slow to what? What does wrath mean? Not just anger. It's the expression of anger. And he tells us where communication is concerned. If you don't want this thing to turn out rotten, then you need to be quick to hear. That reminds me of listening on three dimensions. In order to be a good communicator, you've got to be a great listener. You've got to be able to listen to what a person is saying. You need to try to listen to what they might mean by what they're saying. And you definitely need to learn how to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying about what they're saying, about what they might be saying, and about what they're not saying at all. I thought about this. What does it mean to be swift to hear? Like, can you actually listen fast? <laughs> this is the Holy Ghost, y'all. The God's helping us. What does the Bible mean to be swift to hear? And what I, what I received in my heart, how many of you had had, have had to have somebody say something to you more than one time? You didn't get it the first time. I remember me and this lady in customer service was just going back and forth about the same thing. <laughs> and then she had an expression on her face. She was looking at me like, is he slow? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm not, I even told her, I said, I'm not slow. <laughs> but listen, I didn't get it the first time. I believe that's what he's talking about. Be swift to hear. Hear it the first time. Don't let it be a long time. Don't, don't be like that guy that I counseled in another state where he came home and everything was gone. He thought the marriage was going good. But he wasn't listening to what she was trying to say. And she reached a place where it was too much. And she left. And he was blindsided because he was the opposite of swift to hear. He was slow to hear. He didn't get it. He didn't get it the first time. Somebody say be swift to hear. Then he says, be slow to speak. The Bible says if you answer a matter before you hear it, you didn't hear the whole thing. And you're talking about, yeah, well, this part, but that ain't the whole, that ain't even the main thing. And you stuck on this part. So be swift to hear, slow to speak. And then the focus of this, because we're talking about wrath can corrupt the conversation between you and your spouse or future spouse. Wrath, slow to anger or slow to in the expression of your anger. I'll leave it at that. What's the third thing that can corrupt communication? Man, we're going right down the list. Stop telling lies. You know, speak the truth. Um, tell the truth. Stop lying. The second one was be angry and sin not. Don't let your wrath. So that's number two. The third one was don't give the devil place. How many of y'all know if you let the devil in your conversation, that thing's going to be rotten. 
Come on, it's going to turn bad. It's going to be a poor quality. If you let the devil be the one to give you the words to say to the person that you're talking to, how many of y'all can clearly see that the devil's thoughts can corrupt the communication? Um, okay. In Ephesians 6 and 16, we were talking about above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Somebody say all the fiery darts of the wicked. That word wicked, which is used throughout the Bible to describe the devil, he's wicked, is a very interesting word. The word wicked means hurtful or evil. We have like at Hobby Lobby I was there yesterday to buy something for the church stuff they have wicker furniture how many of y'all know what I'm talking about when I say wicker furniture and what is wicker furniture it's pieces of wood or, or branches that are twisted together so there's some connection between the devil and stuff getting twisted look at your neighbor and say don't get it twisted the devil, in a conversation, <laughs> will twist your words in the other person's mind. Or twist your words in your own mind. And if you allow it, because God says don't allow corrupted communication to come out. Don't let the devil's thoughts twist things and cause communication to be corrupted. Let me give you another verse to help you along this line. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, he says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. There's some very powerful words in this verse. Number one, alien. Listen, your wife is not an alien. Somebody wrote a book like decades ago. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. They're like aliens from other planets. Oh, y'all not going to nod and say amen. But I get it. I feel you. I feel you. This is good, right? I was talking to Pastor Archie Collins. He's the pastor of World Changes Church uh, just down the road. They let us house our trailers there at no cost as a seed into the ministry. And we thank God for them. But I was just talking to him in passing. Our boys go to their daycare. And... Um, you know, he was talking, we were talking about some relational counseling type stuff. And one thing that he and his wife remind themselves of continually is that, and they'll say it in the conversation, you're not my, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're not my enemy. You're not my enemy. When I'm counseling couples, when there are feuds within family, people have taken sides, lines have been drawn trenches have been dug and are being dug walls have been erected and we look out at each other through this little hole at the enemy oh i'm preaching good today so in talking in this verse about aliens and enemies he, he also points out that these are things in your mind put up the verse for me again uh these are things in your mind, where is the devil twisting things? You married that person. They're not the enemy. Oh, but Pastor Stan, they are the enemy. Well, the, the devil is twisting and making you think that they're the problem. That they're the problem in your life. And if you don't get rid of them, then you're not going to have peace or happiness in your life. It's in the mind where the enemy has wicked works the, and the wicked works which are twisting things. And then the last point, he says, yet now he has reconciled. I love the word reconcile because when there are broken relationships, whether it be on the job, in the church, whether it be friends that are supposed to be friends and family members that are supposed to be in family members, the word reconcile means to restore to fellowship after estrangement. Say it out loud. Restore to fellowship after estrangement. If something went left in a conversation or a situation and you've got a loved one, 
God's heart for you is that that relationship be restored. And he's doing right now in you a work to help you be better prepared for the conversation that needs to be had. The worst thing that you can do in relationships is try to sweep stuff up under the rug. Acting like something, ha- something didn't happen that really happened. If it touched you, if it hurt you, if something went left about it, it needs to be dealt with and talked about. I want to and I'm able to talk to my wife about anything. And that should be for you as well. I'm getting close. I'm not done yet. So can y'all stay hooked? All right. I'm almost done. We're looking at what can corrupt communication. In Titus chapter 1, verse 15, to, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled or corrupted and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Can I talk to you about this? I'm talking about decades of marriage counseling, relationship counseling. To the pure, I'm the pure person in the room. I'm not the problem, wasn't part of the problem, and I'm here to help. So when I listen to your husband or when I'm listening to your wife or your brother or your mother or your father or whatever the case may be, it's pure. When he tells me he loves you, I believe him. When she tells me that she loves you, I believe her. That's because of what the Bible says. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who, who are defiled, those who have experienced some negative stuff, to those who are unbelieving, nothing is pure. Oh, I'm preaching good. Because in their mind, And in their conscience, something about or that thing that happened, it corrupted them in their perspective of the other person. And so even though we're going through session after session, even though we're trying, I mean, the the person is wanting to be married and and they want to get it right. But because if you if you've allowed corrupt community, if you allow the enemy to twist things in your mind, then it doesn't matter. I won't believe that he loves me unconditionally. I won't believe that he loves me. I won't believe this year. I, I won't. I mean, it could be that, you know, you believe that they've done something or that they're hiding something or that they've kept something. And in truth, they haven't. But to the pure, all things are pure. But those who are co- corrupted. All right, let me take the next step because this is like getting way deep. All right. So don't let the devil twist things in communication, in your mind, don't get it twisted. A corrupt mind is what we're talking about. Um, my brother, Pastor Carroll, does an amazing. He's a great minister. He's our youth pastor, executive pastor. On this past Wednesday night, put up the, uh, the he, he, he had a model of communication. See, when you've got something going in your heart, there's something you want to talk to your child about. You have a message in your heart, and you're the sender. So what you've got to figure out is how do I encode what I'm trying to say, this message, for the other person? But when you speak that as the sender to the receiver, there's something else that has to happen. They've got to decode what you're, what you're trying to say in order to receive it. And then, of course, noise happens in between. What, I, what I'm talking about, if you can look up at me now, what I'm talking about is when the enemy comes, he's trying to get into the encoding process or the decoding. He's trying to get you to put something in the encoding that's going to mess it up in the mind of the receiver. See, you were doing good up until you said that. Oh, y'all got to help me in this church today. He's trying to get you to say something the, the, the wrong way. You got a good message. The, the message is I love you and I want us to get past this, but you brought so he wants you to encode it with something that's corrupted. Or he wants you to he wants it to be decoded. It's going through filters of noise. So let's make progress. Lying corrupts communication. Wrath 
corrupts communication. The devil's thoughts or a corrupted mind corrupts communication. Here's the fourth. A poor choice of words can corrupt communication. A poor choice of words. A poor choice of words. How many of y'all know you could say the right thing, but at the wrong time and mess it all up? You could say the right thing the wrong way at the right time and it still be corrupted. (laughs) So one of the things that corrupts communication is a poor choice of words, including cussing. (laughs) You know, and, you know, we shouldn't be cussing in our text messages. I wouldn't say it if it hadn't happened. Come on, somebody. <laughs> here's, here's the fifth one. Bad timing can corrupt the communication. Just as, it's just at the wrong time. It, it, you got a good message. It's something that we really, really need to talk about. It touches it deeply. But bad timing can corrupt the communication. It's just, I mean, it's just wrong time. Okay. What else can corrupt it? Noise can corrupt communication. Noise. If I did this already. If I'm standing, if my wife is standing at the sink, doing something with the dishes, looking outside of the window, the boys are watching Alexa on the little echo thing. And I'm standing in the mud room, the laundry machines are going, and she says something to me. Oh, it's quiet. Now I get quiet too. Because I had no idea what she said. Noise corrupted communication. And it's so important that we be swift to hear, position ourselves to hear the message that can be. And noise is literally and figuratively. There can be things atmospherically. Oh, oh my gosh. This is like so important. (laughs) If, uh, and this is a part of noise. If you're trying to have a conversation with somebody and they're doing something else, that's going to corrupt the communication. So let me give you the next one. I'll just put this in with this one. Uh, Multitasking can corrupt communication. Doing other stuff while we're supposed to be having an important conversation. It can corrupt the communication in the sender side or the receiver side. Okay, I'll just leave it at multitasking because y'all are getting like way too quiet. How about this nonverbal body language? You're saying the right thing at the right time in the right way, but your face is horrible. (laughs) I'm guilty of this one, right? I mean, your verbal expression during the conversation is, you know, you're like aloof. You know, you're like. I mean, this person is pouring out their heart to you and you got a smirk on your face. All of these things can corrupt communication, but none as great as past history. Play some software for me. Past history. I have seen it where it almost breaks my heart that past history corrupts communication. It's like we can't get past when you were in a bad way and you cussed me out and I've never really been able to get over that. And it has corrupted communication in my mind when I talk to you. Or you did something that you had no business doing and you've repented before God. God has forgiven you. But I can't get past it. And it's a, f- oh, y'all got to help me now. It's affecting how I communicate with you. It's affecting how when I hear you communicate to me, past history. Don't let the past mess up your future. Even if it's something from the past that's bothering you, that you want to talk about and that you need to talk about, You've got to communicate about it. 
but don't let it keep you from the future that you can have. There's two passages that that I'll give you as I close. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. Let's look at it again. In communication, this is one thing that I do. I know last week I told you I was going to do better. I know last week I told you that I'd work on that. And I did it again. But I'm telling you, I'm going to do better. (laughs) Y'all got to help me. (laughs) I'm telling you that that I I get it and these things are going to be different. See, what's, what's bothering you is last week you told me that. What's different now? So what's keeping me, it's the corrupted communication. I'm allowing past things to prevent me. Now, if the next part of the conversation in purity is, well, is there anything that I can do to help you? Because last week you said that you would do it. Is there something that I can do to help you as we go forward? Oh, man, I'm preaching good. Let me give you one. So again, Philippians chapter three, what does it say? It says, forgetting those things that are behind. If we're in a conversation about something that I did today, please don't bring up when we were dating. Please don't bring up that five years ago when your cousin was at the house. Y'all want a box today? Come on. What does the Bible say? It says, forgetting those things that are behind. Let's deal with what happened today. They came over. I didn't know they were coming. And you mad at me? Because they cut the food. Forgetting those things that are behind. Let's deal with today. All right, all right, I'll have a conversation with my cousin that dropped dropped over to the house. This is not a real situation. I'm just making it up for your benefit. Okay, I'll I'll have a conversation with them. um, And and this is what I'll do as a result. Okay, all right, well, cool. I see it now. I didn't know that you didn't know because you talk to them all the time, so I don't see how you... Oh, come on, come on. Don't, 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 Don't let it go bad. Don't let it turn. We were there. We were that close. Last but not least is Isaiah 43 and verse number 18. Did y'all get anything good out of this today? I know you got to be quiet because it's the environment. I get that. I get that. But please be receiving this in your heart. Last but not least, keep it clean. Past history can mess it up. In Isaiah 43 and 18, wow, you mean there are scriptures like this in the Bible? Yeah. Look at what God says. Do not remember the former things nor consider when you're making decisions the things of old if we've got to make a decision about something that's going on right now well let's deal with that but don't bring up the former things don't put in consideration don't hold against me my sin and my trespass learn to forgive like God forgives He doesn't hold your sin against you. This will clean up our conversation. This will help us parents and children. If they're doing something that needs to be corrected, it needs to be corrected. You don't have to reach back in the past to pull it out. It's right here. And we can make some real progress. But the moment you reach back to the former things, you're contaminating you're 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 polluting the communication you're corrupting it and it's not going to fare well in the end i got two more parts i'll get to the next one sunday and then the sunday after that i'll finish the entire series i pray that as a result of this kind of teaching you and your life are going to be better amen amen praise god hallelujah amen if you're watching right now and you don't know jesus christ as your lord and savior If you're here in the building and maybe you visited, you're visiting, 
or, or maybe you've been visiting or you've been coming for a while and you don't have a relationship with God, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Don't leave today without having a right relationship with the Lord. If you bow your head while nobody's looking around, I'm not going to ask you to come here to the altar. I want to pray for you right where you are. I'm going to lead the congregation in a word of prayer so that there's no embarrassment. But if you can pray this and mean this from your heart, God will save you right where you are. You can restore your fellowship with him through the name of Jesus. So if that's you and you want to be saved or you want to come back to the Father, you want to repent of your sins so he can cleanse you from all unrighteousness, then I want you to pray this out loud. Congregation, pray along with me. Say this, God in heaven, I thank you for this word. I do believe that Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God and that he died for me, bearing my sins for me. They put him in a grave, but I believe he's alive. Come into my heart, save me from my sins. Lord, I repent of all my sins and I accept your offer of forgiveness. I repent of all my sins, the things I've said and the things I've done. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness as you've promised in your word. Thank you, Father, for saving me and giving me the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for those that may have prayed this way in Jesus' name. Praise God. Go ahead and stand up on your feet as I speak a word of blessing over each and every one of you as we get ready to depart. <clears throat> I love you, Faith Family Church. It is my great honor to be your pastor. And I thank you for allowing me to preach, you know, so straight, so direct. I feel like I got it all out and I, let, <laughs> I left no, no rock unturned. But more importantly, I pray that you're being equipped with what you need to be better in every area of your life in the name of Jesus. So I speak this blessing over you if you'd raise one hand towards heaven. God gave Moses instruction. He said, I want you to tell Aaron to speak this blessing over my people. And I say this, may the Lord bless you and cause the manifestation of his blessing to be upon your life. May he keep you, guard and protect you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Be increased, be enlarged, and may the hand of favor and protection be over your life everywhere you go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We look to see you next week, and we'll see you online on Wednesday night. You are dismissed. <clears throat>